But yeah, it's not a country festival. I'm a little out of the element. I was the only one wearing a cowboy hat there yesterday. I went for the <laughs> alpine. I went for the I went for the alpine cowboy look. Mm, sold yourself out probably. You're like, oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> Just walk around with a big QR code on your back. That leads that leads right to your Spotify account. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I went first last time. Okay, I'll go first. We're back with another episode of On the Porch with Front Porch Music. Hosted by Jenna and Logan. <laughs> <laughs> what? But that was very melodic. <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> this week... We had a chat with uh, country artist Dawson Gray. He's fairly new to the scene, but he released quite a bit of music just last year. So we dove in, like, went all the way back with Dawson. We learned that he's a planner. Yes. He had a plan for his release schedule, and he stuck to it. He did. Shout uh, out to Factor and Creative BC for teaching him that. That's right. We talked about uh, sports. Uh, we talked about uh, his, his time in baseball and how that helped shape his confidence to be on a stage and to play in front of people. And he's really obsessed with music. Like, yeah. He was saying about like listening to old music, the history of music. He was working a music festival because he wants to know... One, to help his friends, but also, like, you learn so much. So he's very much ingrained in what he does, which is really cool. Yeah. He he came to us right from a music festival. He was, like, out of breath when he sat down to talk to us. And I was going right back at it. Yeah. yeah. He's got lots of music on the horizon this year. Um, get into our chat with Dawson Gray. Get to know him a little bit. On the front porch. <laughs> Welcome to the porch, Dawson Gray. This is gonna be interesting because we don't know much about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the bio online doesn't say much, so I'm, I'm <laughs> loving it. Let's let's really, chat all about. We really leave the people wondering what's up. Yeah, leave them wanting more, Dawson. Yeah, man of mystery, all that fun stuff. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Where, like where, where you're from, who you are. Yeah, absolutely. I'll start with the basics, I guess. Um, so I'm originally from White Rock, which is about 35 minutes, 40 minutes outside of Vancouver, uh, and I grew up there. I lived there until I was about 18, and then for the past seven years, I've lived out in Kelowna. Kelowna is definitely my home now. Uh, I love it out there, um, and if anyone's listening that's not from, like, the BC area, but that's in BC, mm -hmm. Kelowna, it's about four hours outside of Vancouver area, uh, and it's kind of like a little desert out here, so I love it. Uh, currently, I'm sitting up at Big White Mountain, which is about 35 minutes outside Kelowna, uh, and it's nice and snowy up here right now. It's good oh, times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I grew up out there. Um, before music, I am a baseball player and sports guy through and through. Um, that was my first love, all that sort of thing. And um, yeah, I guess that's the most basics, but I'm sure we're going to delve deeper into all of it. Yeah, we got lots more questions than that. Yeah, Kelowna's that's, a that's... real hot spot, it seems like, for music yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, to be honest, I was saying this to my friend the other day, but I, I actually think that if I wasn't in Kelowna, I don't even think I'd be anywhere near where I am in music. Um, and especially the level of how much I love it. Like, I, it's a really big hotbed for live music. I don't think a lot of people know that, too. Um, but even a lot of buddies I have that are out in Vancouver, obviously, there's a big live music scene there. They come out to Kelowna and are blown away. Uh, especially for how small we are and the mm -hmm. amount of live music venues we have and how good the venues are. Um, it's a great place to be a musician. Like I've been to Kelowna before I was in the, in the music industry and it it's a small, it's like a pretty small city. So like to know that there's now that there's like such a vibrant music vibe to it is very interesting. Cause I, uh, when I was there, it, yeah. I couldn't have even imagined it. Yeah. And, and even since I've gotten into it, like I've really only been doing it for about three years now and even in the last three years, it's really exploded. Like some venues like Redbird opened up their outdoors. So they're a 400 cap venue. We just got another new venue called Revelry. That's a 500 cap indoor live music venue. And then there's like, I mean, I think there's about 180,000 people or something in Kelowna, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and there's got to be at least 40 venues you can play at or mm. plus. And that's not really even counting like all the little like wineries and things like that that do like, live music outdoors in the summer and the breweries. So there's just a ton ton going on out here music-wise, which is really awesome uh, for the musicians out here. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're from BC. Well, let's go back in those very short notes you gave us. Um, sports guy through and through. What does that mean? You grew up playing hockey. You grew up playing baseball. Yeah. 
Yeah, I did the Canadian thing. I played hockey. Um, I played hockey until I was 14. Uh, and I played hockey and baseball at the same time. And then I got to the point where I kind of wanted to specialize in baseball. I played both of them at a pretty high level. And it was getting to the point where, like, I was going, like, six days a week on both of them. Like, okay, let's focus our efforts a little bit here. Sounds exhausting. Uh, so then I just went fully baseball for the rest of my uh, high school time. Um, and to be honest, like, when I was in high school, that's, like, all I did. Like, I played baseball. Can't tell you that I paid much attention in school because I thought I was going to be a big baseball star. I thought it didn't matter. Um, and was music on your radar at all? You know, I, I don't actually come from a music background at all in my family. Like, nobody plays instruments. Nobody sings. Um, my family likes music, but in general, it's not – it was never a big thing growing up. Like, we always loved listening to music and stuff, but there wasn't much um, background in it. And then – I didn't really find music until I was about 17 and my best friend during high school, we became best friends in about grade 10. So grade 11 ish area. So when I was about 17, uh, my friend Ben Donald kind of showed me a little bit of singing. I remember I actually, the first time I like kind of fell in love with music, I went over to Ben's house one day and he'd always be practicing. He used to practice like 13 hours a day. And I came to his house one night and he had his mic set up and the speakers going and he was playing the piano and singing in his room. And he's like, you should try and sing one. And he showed me um, an Elton John song called Leave On. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, but I like just instantaneously loved it. And he like taught me it and I like sang it. And then he like was like, dude, you're pretty good at singing. Like you should try and learn. And then shortly thereafter, I started dating a girl who was also a musician. So my best friend and my girlfriend were a musician and Luckily for me, they were both excellent musicians, not just like dabblers, both professionals. Um, so I really quickly like saw, like one, I got to see like what it looks like done at a high level. And two, like I was just around it so much. And quite frankly, I was kind of tired of third wheeling watching that <laughs> music. So um, I, yeah, I, I picked it up when I was 17, 18 and mostly just guitar at that point. I wanted to just play the guitar really well. Um, I didn't sing a whole lot for the first probably three or four years I played guitar. I sang a little bit. Uh, I didn't write songs or anything. And then it was kind of just a hobby until I was about, well, I guess I'll backtrack a little bit. I, I ended up, like I had to quit baseball when I was 18 um, because I started losing my eyesight a little bit. I won't go too deep into that. I always talk about my eyes. And to me, it's not a big deal. But the biggest part about it was it made me quit baseball, which kind of led me to music, which was huge for me. Um, so I ended up in Kelowna because of that. Instead of playing baseball in Kansas City, I went to UBCO to take business management. And music was like just my favorite thing when I got to university because mm -hmm. to be honest, I kind of like lost my identity with baseball. You put so much time and effort into a sport that you just don't really do anything else or care about anything else. So I kind of found music after that. I found some other things like I got really into chess, really into golf as well. <laughs> Um, I used to like go to sleep in my first couple of years of university, listening like chess YouTube videos and stuff like that. That's really funny. Um, but yeah, I played a bunch of guitar in my first three years of university. And to be honest, I wanted to be a lead guitarist. And by about my halfway through my second year of university, I realized that was not in the cards. Like I just don't have the dexterity to do it fast enough. Um, but obviously I can play the guitar well enough to like write songs and sing them. Right. Um, and then yeah, I, I, to be honest, I really, like, at that point, I was very, very into music. Ben showed me a lot, and I got, like, I got obsessed with, like, old music. Like, I went all the way back from, like, the 60s to present day. I've, like, studied it all. And my first artist that I got really into was Jim Croce. Um, I, like, obsessed with him. Jackson Brown, the Eagles, um, so, many, so many older artists. I really fell in love with the songwriting styles. And then that kind of led me to like looking into songwriting and singing a little bit more. At that time, I started covering a lot of songs, but not really writing. And then it wasn't until Zach Bryan came out that I started writing songs. And when I heard Head and South by Zach Bryan and his first album, I remember the moment I heard it, I was sitting on my buddy's boat with him in the middle of the lake. It was just me and him. We were having a few drinks. Uh, we actually were drinking um, this drink, uh, Peach Crown Royal and Lemonade. And I call them gray y'alls. They're, they're like my homemade hay y'all. <laughs> um, 
So we were drinking Ray, Ray on the boat yeah. and, and Head and South by Zach Bryan came on. I'd never heard him before. It had just come out. And I literally was like, what song is this? Like, who is this artist? Because it's like the first time I feel like I'd heard modern music that like really made sense to me. Like, I'm like, hey, I like, I think I can write like that. And I think I can sing like that. Like, that's something I can do. And that was that night I went home, wrote my first song. And then from then on, it was just a slow, slow snowball. Um, like I even for the next year and a half, like I never intended to be a musician. I just really fell in love with it, wrote songs in private and really enjoyed it. And then, yeah, I'm just going to keep going. Cause I guess I'm going to keep talking about yeah, this. This is great. This makes our job um, easier. So, so then, yeah. So I just kept going in my fourth year of university. I, I practiced a lot more, especially songwriting. Like I ended up, I would try and write a couple songs a week and none of them were very good. And to be honest, I still wasn't very good at that time. I was still learning how to sing. That was like the main thing. Like I just, I don't think I'm a natural born singer. Um, and I think I've really learned how to use my voice and it took me a long time to kind of find what I do well, what I don't do well um, and how to work within that. And especially in songwriting, playing to my strengths rather than writing songs that go against them. Mm. Um, and then I started actually like playing for people in summer of 2021 um and i remember it was the may long weekend i had bought in this bose speaker where you can plug in a mic to it and a guitar mm -hmm. and it's a kicking speaker like i think it was 900 dollars, and it was a lot of money for a speaker but it like is awesome because it's bluetooth portable 11 hours battery i and love I, bose speakers i have like four it, they're amazing and i still have it to this day it's killer um, and I bought it mainly for like parties at my house. So at that time I was in my partying phase, but I also got it because you could play music through it. I'm like, man, maybe I'll like play music for friends one day or something. And there was one day on the May long weekend that a bunch of my buddies came over. We had like 15 guys there. And a lot of them uh, were from Calgary. They were like my buddy's brother's friends. So I didn't know them. And a lot of them played guitar and they like asked me to play for them. So we we're on the deck and I played through the speaker and they're like, man, like you should try play for play for people. Like even just go busk on the street one day. Um, and I thought about it, but didn't do it. And then I remember in August, right at the start of August in 2021, I had COVID. So I was like, you couldn't leave the house for two weeks. And I finished my last day of COVID. And I still have one more, like that day off of work and nothing to do. So I was like, Screw it. I'm going to go try and busk. It was a Thursday afternoon. I think it was 3 p.m. I knew 11 songs off by heart, like where I felt comfortable singing them. I'm like, okay, these 11 songs, I'm going to go play 11 songs and I'm just going to come home. Um, I went out there, I played 11 songs and I made like 220 bucks in my guitar case in wow. like 45 minutes. And then I went out the next night and I had like a crowd of like 250 people and I just played those 11 songs like three times over and I made like $800 and then I quit my landscaping job the next day and then <laughs> bust. I bust for the rest of that month. And then like after that month, I was like, okay, like I'm going to do this. And then it snowballed. It's come very far from there. Like at that point, like I still knew nothing. It took a really long time. I think the like the next year I played like 200 little gigs in Kelowna. Like I'd play anything I could just to get mileage and that's a lot of gigs. Like, yeah. Like I did a ton. Um, and I did a ton with Mitch Zorn, my buddy, like, and that was the nice part. We were able to do more cause we played duo. So we could switch back and forth, take little vocal rests and things like that. If one my voice was gone one night, he'd sing a bit more. And yeah, I, I learned a ton. Um, that was 2022. And then, Last year was a huge year where I kind of took a bigger jump. I I actually like really organized what I was doing with music because of the Creative BC grant program where you have to create a plan yeah. in mm -hmm. order to get the grant when you apply. And rather than hiring a grant writer, like I, I've done a lot of like papers and things like that in university. And to me, it's just a project. I'm like, okay, this is like the same as like I do in university. So I ended up taking a month to write mine. Like I really went deep on it and planned out the next year, really set goals, what I wanted to do and how to take that next step. And from there, like I ended up getting that grant, another factor grant. So 
It allowed oh, me to record wow. a bunch of music last year. Yeah, so I I did really well with grants, which I'm like so grateful that like yeah. we have that in Canada because I know like a lot of U.S. artists that are my friends now, and they are like, man, like that's like a godsend to have that opportunity, and it was huge for me. Um, it allowed me to do so much, and especially getting music out. Um, and then yeah, it's really snowballed from there. And then this year is like a whole nother ball game. Now we're now we're fully going. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, and and up until I mean last year I was a project manager after university, so I had a full time job with music. And then this last summer I took up music full time. That's all I do now. Congrats! That's really so, great. That's yeah. awesome so fast yeah i was gonna ask back when you like the first time you you know just got over covid and you decided to go out and busk for that first time i was gonna ask like when you pulled out that guitar out in public was that really like nerve-wracking but it didn't sound but if if you made that much money it didn't sound like you were that nervous yeah it was it was weird i think i was nervous for like two songs but i like loved it like it was like i love that feeling of like nervousness like for me that like whenever i'm nervous or anxious or whatever Like, in those situations, it makes me feel alive. Like, I love that. Like, I relish that. It gives me, like, the same feeling I used to get in baseball in, like, a big game. And especially now, like, when we hop on a bigger stage or it's a bigger show, like, I love that feeling of, like, this is it. Like, this is – it's go time. Like, the – the, and now, especially, it doesn't – it's not nerves. It's, like, adrenaline now. Mm. I just get so excited to get out there. Um, Do you think think playing baseball so, like, competitively helped you prepare for that? A hundred percent. And to be honest, like a lot of what I do in music is very much rooted in the same things that I used to do as a baseball player. Like it is the exact same concepts to me, just applied to a different skill, Hmm. right? Like you're like, it's baseball or music, but like in order, like if I'm trying to be really successful in music and compete at a high level, like that same work ethic, that same like drive is all, it's, it's all the same. Right. And Especially, like, when I think about, like, when I play baseball, like, trying to make a team, like, Team BC, like, you don't want to be, the like, the 14th player to make that team. You want to be in the top six on that team, so you're a no-brainer. And, like, the things you need to do in order to be a no-brainer are, like, learn skills that take time to, like, ingrain in you. So, absolutely, like, it's a very similar thing to me. And, like, I'm very grateful I played sports at a high level because of the, of the things I got from them. Um, this is- such a classic story because like (laughs) there's so many athletes turned musicians like you've got chad brownlee and you've got like we were just talking to zach mcphee who's from bc as well and mark ledlin like we're just like why are athletes why do they turn to music and it's a different answer every time but it basically says the same thing like you learn skills you learn discipline you learn that like you can do things that you think you can't do and then you just channel it into a different like more creative outlet it's really interesting a hundred percent. It it almost gives you a little bit of blind confidence at times too. Like, <laughs> yeah. I like I don't know why I think like this, but I was like, if I could be really as good as I was at baseball, like why can't I just do that with something else, right? Like, exactly. And so, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you've probably embarrassed yourself on the baseball field at some point. <laughs> that, so. On a stage, you're like, I've done this. It's fine. Also, I know also. Yeah. <laughs> nothing nothing in music has ever been as embarrassing as moments i've had playing sports so like that's that's absolutely a really good point like i've had times like where i'm playing baseball where i'm like i want to crawl inside of a hole and never come out yeah and like in music i'm at the point now where like if i make like a like if i have a massive voice crack on stage i just laugh like i it, nothing can phase me on that front like i'm not afraid of mistakes anymore that's for sure that's and to be healthy. honest like I make mistakes all the time in music. Like, if you're not making mistakes, you're probably not doing enough. Like, you're not trying enough new things at all. Totally. Mm. Um, yeah. We need to go back. We, You brushed over getting a Creative BC and a Factor Grant on the first try. Mm-hmm. That's pretty yeah. huge. Like, that's – and you did it by yourself. Yeah, that uh, – to be honest, like, that was something that, like, like I said, it really had a – profound impact on like my development in the last year and a half um one because of the monetary side of it but honestly the biggest part was like the belief after getting those grants where I was like okay like there clearly is something here and now I like have like some monetary value to back it and most importantly a really well laid out plan 
Um, and, and those, those grants, like I really did take that quite seriously. Cause I saw that as like a really huge opportunity for me. So like, when I say I took a month to write for my grant, like I really like sat down like every day, like fine tooth combed everything. And like, rather than just writing something out that sounded good, I was like, is everything realistic? Like, is this doable? And, but is this also like, I, I want it to be really hard for me to accomplish, but like still doable. And it was really good for me. Like it, it not only set me up to like go through the like last year with a really good plan, but it also like ingrained goal setting for me really well for music. Like I, I do my own little projects all the time now, like every three months I'm doing that. Even if it's not for a grant, I'm planning out as far ahead as I can. Like yeah. at this point, I'm already like setting my sights on like 2025, like 2024 is already done for the most part for me on the back end of things. Now I just got to go do it, yeah. play the shows, release the songs that I've already written and set up for recording. And then, yeah, I'm, tr I'm always trying to get like another, if I can get like two years ahead of schedule on my planning, then it just is like the farther and farther ahead I can get, the better you do. And especially like the music industry is not running in current, like in everything it is, like whether you hear a song that just came out, that song was not written a week ago, that song was not recorded a month ago. Usually it's like a year or even two years or four years ago, some of that stuff. Um, and, and the same side with like live music, like a festival that you're gonna play. Like for me, I get frustrated at times because I feel like I've just reached the point where I'm, I'm in the ballpark of playing festivals and like kind of getting across Canada a bit more but it's frustrating to me because I'm like, I needed to be like planning that last year to get this year or like the year before, like I, now I've missed the boat on those things. Right. So like, I'm always trying to get as far ahead as I can. So you're on top of it. That is well, very planned out. Like we talked, I don't know if you remember this. It was like two years ago, but Devin Cooper was saying the same thing about a project, uh, project wild. I think it was, it mm -hmm. just like yeah. sitting down and doing these things yourself instead of like you, you could have hired a grant writer but it, it sat you down and it made you like, if I have all of this laid out in front of me, I'm actually going to do it. And then you yeah, plan yeah. it and then you just keep going and you keep going. And then you, like you said, like you're thinking about next year already. And that's an interest, interesting. You're already in that mindset. Like you've only been at this for what would you say? Like three or four years. So that's pretty, I would say three years of trying. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty like developed. I mean, like, you're, you're obviously no strain, like not afraid of hard work because that is a lot of work yeah. and that's really great. Yeah. And it's really great for other artists who are just starting out to hear that too. Totally. And and I will say like one thing for me, like I'm really good at working hard when I'm, when I'm really into what I'm doing. And that's like one thing that I've like loved about music. Like it's one of the first things besides baseball I've found in my life where I'm like, it doesn't matter how many hours I spend. It doesn't feel like a lot of hours or like hard work. It just feels like something I like it. And especially the more I get into it, like, it's the first time like, hey, I don't have like fear of missing out of going to like the bar on a Friday night now. I'd like rather sit at home and do some music because that's like more fun for me. Mm. Um, yeah. But I mean, don't get me wrong. Like there is some really frustrating sides of it. And it's like oh, yeah. very much so like I, you like the more I get it into it, the more I realize like if you really want to be successful, it's the nitty gritty non fun stuff that makes all the difference. Yeah. And yeah. like the fun stuff is good, but like, it's not, that's not the difference maker. And even things I love, like songwriting, like songwriting is my first love of music and it is my favorite thing. But like, even that, like, if you really want to have, like put out an amazing EP, you don't get to write just when you feel inspired. You got to write all the time. Like lately I've been writing so much that I realized like I used to write a great song and be like, I have this song and I'm just going to wait to put it out. I don't need to beat it. And now I'm like, no, like a lot of the great songs I wrote like six months ago, I'm beating them constantly. And if you want to just keep getting better, you need to like be like, okay, I have all these awesome songs. I'd like to record these. But now I'm like, okay, this, these are the ones I'm going to record, but then I'm trying to beat them. And if I write something better that pushes them down the line, they might never get recorded if I keep beating them. Right. Totally. But that stuff is frustrating at times too, because you can never relax. No. This whole industry can be frustrating at times. Yes, very much so. <laughs> As sort of a newcomer still, what are you learning and finding interesting? Like, have you been to your first CCMAs? Have you learned, like, 
the networky stuff and the things yeah. that like are you have to do them, but you just you'd rather not. Yeah, that's actually been one of my favorite parts uh, of late is the networking side. Like I think until about, I mean, last summer I started it a bit more and a little bit before, but generally speaking, I didn't really reach out outside of Kelowna and my circle until about eight months ago. Like that's when I really started going, okay, like who are all the people across Canada doing the same thing I'm doing or whether they're working in the business end What is everyone doing? Who is everyone? How do I meet them? How do I get more connected? And definitely the biggest like starting point for me was the CCMAs this year. Hmm. So I got to go to that and it was like the best week ever. I got so blessed while I was there. Like so many great people like gave me amazing advice. I got to like, I mean, see some of my favorite artists in person, talk to them, meet them, hear them play. Um, And just like being like, in that space where you're around all these other people that are operating in the same field you're in. Whereas like in Kelowna, like there's a lot of live music, but there's not that many people doing what I'm doing in the country space. Like there's like two Mm -hmm. or three of us. And then even in BC, there's not that many. So like when you finally get everyone together in a space like that, and you can be around those like-minded people, it's a really, really cool experience. Um, and you can kind of like have those conversations where you know you're not alone on the frustrating side of things. And then you know you're not yeah. alone on like where you're like, hey, I think I have this really cool idea, but I don't know if it's stupid. And then you talk to someone else. You're like, no, that's great. Like mm. those sort of things like are really cool. And then beyond the CCMAs, like I went to the CMAs in Nashville this year. And I was really lucky to have some people bring me to some awesome stuff. I got to meet some great people out there. And I actually just was in Nashville again a month ago. Um, So, yeah, the networking side has been amazing. Like, that's definitely been my favorite part of the last year is branching out a bit more. Um, And and one thing that I find is every time I have another conversation, meet another person, like, those things are so, so impactful to what I'm doing as an artist. Like, Mm -hmm. I really don't think you can do it if you're not doing that side of things. Like, I actually think that, I mean, when I was in business school, like the, they say this cheesy line, like your network is your net worth. And it is like cheesy as hell, but it is like the utmost importance in business. And like, for me, like I look at myself as a startup company, like as an artist, like that is what I am. Like I'm Mm -hmm. a small startup company. It's no different than any other business. And like that side of things is everything. Because especially like most of what I'm doing is like learning right now. And when you're learning, it's a lot easier when you hit a roadblock to ask somebody who's broken through that roadblock and has done it for a long time than it is to white knuckle it in a dark room by yourself. Totally. So like for me, like I'm constantly reaching out on a weekly basis. Like I have like a lot of Zoom calls where I just am like, hey, like, I would love to have a conversation with you. Would you like to chat? And I get to, I get so much great insight with people Mm. and the music industry is really, really good for that. Like, I think, I think it's because there's been so many people like me that are now farther down the line that once had somebody help them just like they're helping me. So it's very much a pay it forward kind of thing. Um, Exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's lucky that, that, that you found the people that, you can, that you've that you been able to do that with because there are quite a few people in the industry as well that I think that don't feel the same as you as being yeah. able to find people that can are open to chat with. So it's it's good to hear, yeah. hear that that's still possible. <laughs> yeah, I get frustrated when people are like overly closed off. I get it at times because there is also the side of like, especially like if somebody is really successful in the music industry, like they get that a lot and you only have so much time. I understand when people are gun shy about it. Um, But then there's like people like a good example is the James Barker band. Um, We got to open up for them a month ago in Kelowna and they were amazing. Like they, Mm -hmm. they stood side stage during our entire set, talked to us before the show, after the show. Uh, When I went out to Nashville, Connor, their drummer met up with me for drinks, gave me some great advice uh, and he actually came out to one of my um, writer's rounds when I played in Nashville. Like, cool. those type of things mean so much to a new artist like me. Like, not just, not only, like, giving you the confidence, like, like hey, like, these guys that have done it at a very high level believe in me. Um, but also, like, it just, yeah, like, it's, 
it's really special to like see people that are that successful, like giving back and like genuinely caring about the industry. I think like for me, a big thing that I always like think about when I think about like, what do I want to do with my life? And before music, even like, I always wanted to do something that like felt like right to me, like a job that felt right and felt like it was for the right reasons. And when I meet people like the James Barker band, like, it feels like I'm in the right place, doing the right things, like doing good for the world and all those sort of things. And like, when there isn't that, when it's really like, like at times the music industry is the complete opposite of that, where it's like very cutthroat and dark. And it just, those things stymie like development because it just is, like there's so many artists that quit because they're just jaded by like that mm -hmm. side of the industry. So. I very much try and find people that aren't like that and that are very um, passionate about music still, because I think if you're around that more, it rubs off on you. Right. And then you're, yeah, like you're just excited about what you're doing. Right. Rather than just plugging away at something that doesn't feel good anymore. Right. And it's better that we all support each other. Yeah. And even I'm just thinking like, knowing that somebody gave a shit and helped you now five years down the line, when somebody's asking you, you're going to be like, of course, I'm happy to give you my time. Totally. It'll feel like, totally. exactly. Okay. Let's talk about, um, and this, sorry, this is a really quick, like hot take on that topic that I've been thinking about lately, but I think <laughs> like a lot of artists that I have met that are like very jaded by music and upset with the industry. Don't do the business end. Like they, outsource and don't do things themselves and then they don't get the results they want because it's out of their control and they feel well, and they don't even know what I, what's going yeah. on really and i think that's what happens to artists is they don't they just feel helpless and frustrated because they took something that they love like singing and writing songs and they need they they either need help or don't necessarily want to do the business end because they don't think it's like they think that's the evil side of it um, and then they don't get the result they want or they get taken advantage of, or it just, it, they lose that love for it. And I think like, that's a huge thing that like, I really have learned to love with music. Like I love being an artist and I love writing and the like music history, everything. I'm obsessed with music, but I am like equally a, as obsessed as like just emailing people and like doing like weird little, like business background stuff and I think like that's like kind of one thing that makes me a little bit unique in that sense like I really do love the back end thing um booking shows like I book all my shows I do everything on that side of things and right. I love it um you but I feel like that DIY artist <laughs> yeah and I, and I feel like that's where artists can kind of like gain that love back where they like if you have control of that and you feel empowered then like you really like get to decide right like, and I then get when you do let it I go, do. it's because it's like the right time in your career and it makes sense exactly. for people to be coming on board, right? Yeah. And, and like I said, if I'm a startup company, like if I'm one day going to build a very successful company, like you need to hire people, you need to like expand the company, like otherwise you can't grow. But if you are going to grow a company and hire people in order to hire the right people, you need to have done that job before. Every single job. Otherwise, so how do you, you know, know what you right? need to outsource and what you don't want to outsource? Like for me, I know very well what I want to outsource one day and what I want to maintain control of. Um, and then also, I know who I, the type of person I want to hire and what skill set I'm looking for when well, those help, days come. Right. It helps because like if you've done it before, you know what to look for when someone's doing it, so you can tell if you're being screwed or someone's yeah. bullshitting you. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. It's like a construction. It's a guy that owns a construction company. Like he's built everything on that site. Like he knows how to build it better than anyone else. He's not lazy when he's walking around overseeing it. He's just done his dues and it's time to hire other people. And he knows that they're doing a good job or a bad job. Right. Exactly. I think my yeah. siblings would tell you otherwise about their site managers, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the music part. So you started releasing music. What was it like releasing your first single? Was it like, were you itching? Were you scared? Were you like, what am I doing? What have I got myself into? What's the like day before release day look like the first time? Yeah. So 
Well, technically, the first song I put out is called Drinking Alone. <laughs> um, and that is like before like this, like the era of me actually releasing music. And I did that with my friend Nick Gilmer. And I actually met him when I was busking on the street. And he came up to me. He's like, hey, man, like I produce just for fun. I don't really do country music. But like if you ever want to come over and do a song one day, like we should do it. And so I did. And we ended up spending like two months doing a couple like demos and stuff. And just for me, like learning how to be in a studio. And like I'm so grateful for that experience. Like because one, like he just helped me out as a friend, which is huge. Like I didn't have the money to do a song at that time. And he showed me so many things and like, it's not like my greatest song I have out. We were both learning and like, it's a bedroom song. Like we did everything in the box, like nothing's live tracked, but like, I like, even now, like I keep that song on my Spotify as like a reminder of like, Hey, like that was like the start of it. It's cool to me. Um, but that was like a year before I did anything else, putting another song out. So, I mean, on that release, it was weird. Cause I didn't really, Nobody knew I was doing music too, too much. I kind of just put it out. So, like, that was my first release. I was a bit nervous, but I also knew nobody was really going to hear it. So, <laughs> I was like, it's okay. Um, and, like you I said, I didn't put first money release. into it or anything. <laughs> and I was still, like, just kind of winging it. But I, I learned a lot from that. And then when I got to the point of putting out Running Back Home, which, for me, is my first single mm -hmm. um, in the studio, I was just excited. Like, I was just pumped. I was like, finally, like, I have, like, I've, I'd been writing songs for a while at that point. I had songs I felt really good about. And I'm like, finally, I hear myself and it's elevated. Like, I, I feel like I can compete at a high level with something like this. And I never, like, felt content on it. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, my first few songs, like, I listen to them now. And I listen to them when they first came out the exact same way where I'm like, these are good. I can beat this. This is a great building block. Um, so there's definitely, like, a bit of nervousness. Like... I had very high expectations um, that were scared me. Like, I think that was the scariest thing. I set my goal at 75,000 streams per song on a six song single run that I did with that project. Um, and I beat it on every single song, but I didn't think I was going to beat it. I like, like I said, when I planned that create creative BC thing, like I like thought of all the avenues and how I can get playlisting, how I can get fans, all of this. I'm like, this is the number I want to get to. It's going to be very hard. And I think that project is at 2 million streams now, which is like amazing. Um, but it was definitely very nerve wracking and a lot of hard work on the back end. Like I said, like I very much had to like those things they didn't just happen. It's not like people just heard running back home out of the blue and were like, Oh my God, I love this song. I'm going to listen to it 20 times. Like I had to do a lot of things to get it to where, it, get it in front of people get people hearing it, get my name out there. Um, so it was a really like hard time, like a lot, like definitely last year I was a lot less certain in everything I did. Like I didn't know if people would like things. I didn't know if it was good or bad. Whereas now I think I have a much better idea of what I'm trying to do when I'm like not liking something when I am. And even now, like, I, or during that time, like I would pick a song, record it, put it out. Not much change of plans. Now I like, I have like 15 songs I've recorded mm. and I'm like, let's redo these eight. I completely want to redo them. These four, I'm like, let's tweak this one. Let's put that one out right now. That one's perfect. Like I'm, I now I've come up with like a much more like, it's not just one song. Let's focus on all this and it's gotta be perfect. And if it's not right, like I very much, I, I don't know. I, I learned a lot. I don't, I don't know exactly how to explain that process, but yeah, yeah. it's changed a lot now. Uh, and I think it's getting like, especially now releasing songs, <clears throat> I have a lot more confidence um, in putting things out mainly because I know I've put a lot more work in. Like I, this year, especially I've worked really, really hard on songwriting and the production side of things. Like I've spent hours and hours in my buddy's studio, like learning production myself so that when I work with producers, I walk in and I know what I'm doing. Um, for instance, the song I have coming out, it's called Back to Leaving. And it comes out April 26th. And that song took five hours to do. Five hours from start to finish. That was it. Done. And it is the best song I have by a good margin, in my opinion. Um, it's the most proud I, ha I have been of something. But it didn't take five hours. It took like hundreds of background hours of doing other things to know exactly what I was going for when I walked in. 
And that is like the biggest difference I've noticed from last year to this year. Like I know what I'm doing in a studio and I don't know if a lot of people realize like, or even artists, like how much the studio is a skill for an artist. Mm. Like that's why like there's guys like Luke Bryan that crush it, that are not near as talented as like someone like Chris Stapleton, but like Luke Bryan, I bet you when he walks into a studio, he knows who Luke Bryan is. He knows what he's trying to sound like and do. And he, he executes a vision every time, right? That's a great point because Luke Bryan's been getting a lot of flack lately for just <laughs> <laughs> being himself, actually. Yeah. Not even like his being yeah. a musician or an artist at this yeah. rate. Luke yeah. Bryan's just Luke Bryan. He knows himself. I'm just going to fill up my water. Go for it. <laughs> I am back. Welcome back. Unfortunately, two days at the music festival has been a lot of yelling on site and I'm running around like, well, it's loud music trying to like coordinate with the team. So is this an- water saved my voice a little bit. Is this an outdoor festival? It is in the snow on top yeah, of the snow. Why? Isn't that like rough on the instruments, rough on your voice? It's rough on everything, but it's fun. Fair. <laughs> Fair. It's great. <laughs> Everyone's in like retro ski suits and stuff. It's great. Milky Chance is headlining tonight, and I think the X Ambassadors play right before him. Ooh, fun. No so it'll be cool. You know who the X Ambassadors are. I definitely don't. You, don't. you would know some of their songs. Yeah. And then Milky Chance has like Stolen Dance, that one song. Um, and then Down by the River. A couple great songs. That's in- that's fun that you're like involved in like other festivals and stuff too. Like that's that's feels yeah like I really like I said like I really enjoy that side of things like I do a lot of bookings for friends and like I said I do all my bookings and like even with a lot of our shows in Kelowna like it's not just a show like we do like we'll bring in like beer sponsors we'll bring in like merch of my buddies companies like we'll do we'll do an event around the show rather than just like essentially mini festivals um and especially like with my friends Mitch Carefoot and Kurt Jory run this festival. It's called Altitunes. They also run Denim on the Diamond, which is a country festival in Kelowna. They run another one called Island Times. So I, I about two years ago, wanted to get involved in that side of things because I am a professional project manager as well. So like I really learned a lot about that side of the industry too. Um, and to be honest, like as an artist, like one day I'd like to put together my own festival. Um, that's absolutely something I'd like to do um so yeah i love helping out with this stuff and learning and even for me like i got to like i'm i was pulling chairs around and setting up tables right before this call but milky chance was doing a sound check and i'm just head over my shoulder watching how they're doing their sound check the entire time like what are they these guys are some of the best in the world what do they do different in their sound check than us because those things matter right like all of it matters so there's a lot to be learned just from working at these things we could probably talk artists. for hours about working at a festival because I that's where I kind of came from in, in the music industry as well and yeah. working tons of festivals and I could I could talk about it forever. It's such a great experience. Yeah. No, are it's, you, it's awesome. Are you tired? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always tired. <laughs> it's just feels, always tired. It feels like a lot. <laughs> but yeah. you know what? It'll it's worth it. It pays off. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's great. I, like I said, I I, I can do a lot more music than I can do of something else. If you yeah. put me on a if you put me on a landscape site about six hours in, I'm ready to get out of there. Six but hours. Give me two hours and it, I'm, re- I'm ready to Yeah. Go. But when it comes to music, like I can do more. <laughs> Fair enough. I got more in the tank. Fair enough. Okay, so you have a new single coming out April twenty sixth, is that what you call it? What you said? April twenty yeah, sixth? Back to leaving, yeah. Right April twenty sixth. Right on um well that will be very exciting we are coming definitely coming to the end because we record for like 30 minutes usually but uh i feel like this is just this, we'll have to have a part two to this this is just like cracking the egg yeah i'm just getting started so your new single yeah. coming out soon but, but before we en- ended up here why don't you tell us a bit about it yeah yeah it's it, it came about in kind of a cool way um i wrote a verse the first verse on Valentine's Day this year. And it was the first Valentine's Day I've spent like fully alone in a long time. <clears throat> and I was just sitting at my house. It's like 11 at night, kind of sad. But uh-huh. lately, like I specialize in writing sad breakup songs, but like in the last little while, especially as I've been trying to write more with other people, trying to get away from that. Um, not necessarily like get away from it forever, but like expand my horizons, learn different skill sets, write different songs. So it's been something I kind of strayed from a little bit um, because I've already kind of gotten good at that. But I was sad and I um, 
decided I'm like, tonight I'm going back to it. I'm writing a little solo <laughs> sad song. And I had this line, like it was the opening line was like, I was almost forgetting I got a heartbreak obsession. That was like what I thought my head. I'm like, okay, let's write like something with using that as the first line. So I wrote this verse and it was really, really good. I threw it up on my Instagram story that night, got a ton of responses, like this one's really cool. But it was one of those songs where you get stuck on it. Like it just doesn't go anywhere. Like I could not write a chorus that made sense or that hit, like it just melodically didn't go anywhere. Meanwhile, on Instagram, they're like, release the whole song. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm like, the I gotta whole finish song it. Doesn't exist. <laughs> it's yeah, like, not. This is the whole song. <laughs> yeah. So um, I left it for a bit and I knew it was good. I was like, I'm going to write this at some point. It's going to happen. I don't know when. I don't know what it's going to be, but it'll work. But I'll leave it. And I have a ton of those. Sometimes they sit forever. Sometimes they sit for a day. This one sat for about a month and a half. And then I had a write with Nate Cavalli and Eli Elias James. And I'd never write, written with Elias. I write with Nate quite a bit. He's a good friend of mine. And we were, writing, we were writing something else and it just wasn't it. So we just scrapped that idea. And then we were like, what's another idea? And I'm like, well, like I got this little voice memo. It's, I don't really know what to do with it. Maybe you guys can help me figure this one out. So I played it for them. And then I just had this like eureka moment where I was just like, let's scrap the chords and like let's scrap this melody but like the lyric ideas is, is so strong like i feel like we can just immediately come up with something better by reworking it and then i was like but i don't know how to do that <laughs> all i did was play new chords and hummed a new melody and then elias um reworked some of the verse it, like moved it around and then we just had it going but then we got stuck again where we like wrote this verse. It was cool again. And we got to the chorus and we're like, it's not going anywhere. And then we just didn't have a hook or an idea for it. Like it was really good lyrics with nowhere to go. Mm. And that was always the problem with it. And then I literally threw out back to leaving like so nonchalantly. Like I did not like it. Like I was just like, what about back to leaving? And they're like, sure, let's go for it. And then all of a sudden we just caught fire and in like 15 minutes finished the song. Wow. And we just had this amazing chorus melody. It just like panned out, but it was like such a hard write where like we almost didn't have fun writing it. Like it was like every line was like a grind for such a long time. Then when we finished the write, like none of us were happy. Like we were like, oh, okay, we got one ish. And then I hung up the phone and then I texted him, like, I'll send a voice memo so we have it. We can revisit it if we need. And I played it once in full because we hadn't even sang it yet. We just wrote it. <laughs> and I sang it. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, this is awesome. Like, <laughs> I sent it to them. And I'm like, guys, like, I don't know why we didn't feel good about this, but this is, like, a heater. And then a week later, I tracked it in Nashville. Hmm. And now it's coming yeah. out. I've always wanted to be, like... Out. I've always wanted to be a fly on the wall or at least like sitting in the room observing in the, in those kinds of moments when like a song is like you're, everyone's just kind of feeling fine. Yeah. And just kind of just watch and and observe how everyone kind of reacts and, and what everyone's like, pro, like brain process is. Cause it's so fascinating to me. Um, yeah. Like it's, it's a, it's a really interesting experience writing with other people. Like I didn't really get into it until this year. Like this winter, I did it a lot. Um, and it's different every time. And it depends on who you're writing with. But it can be tough. Like if you don't have it, it's just like banging your head against the wall with three other people. And you're just like, everyone's feeling tight where you're just like, ah. Oh. And then when you have it, it's just like the best feeling mm -hmm. ever where you're bouncing off each other. And it's, it's different every time. And one thing I've learned too is like, it doesn't matter how good of a writer you are. It's all about the idea. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the idea you turn into a bad writer pretty quick. So like, that's the biggest thing. And I've learned when I go into rights now, like I try and show up with three ideas. Like, that's what I want every time. I want three ideas that I think are worthy of writing to so that I avoid the bang my head against the wall thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been really fun. That was, that was a really interesting, right? Like that was a, that was a unique one where it was a, a one of the only ones where it was like almost a bad time, but created something so good. And usually, like, when you're creating an awesome song, like, you know it when you're doing it. Um, and then usually when it's a bad time, it's a bad song. But that mm -hmm. was an interesting one. Like, that was the first one where I'm like, we battled. Like, we worked for that song. So uh, it felt even better. So releasing it's going to be, like, 
a great totally. feeling. <laughs> yeah. A, a labor of like love and hate. <laughs> yes. And to be honest, it shines in the song. Like the song has this dark, dark melody to it and like bite in the lyrics that like genuinely I think was from that right. So Well, I can't wait to hear it. Yeah. Cool. Well, Dawson, thanks so much for joining us. We've hit the end of our time together here. Um, really appreciate you you r- rushing home from this music festival <laughs> to uh, talk to us. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate you guys having me on. I it was a great conversation. Hopefully, we can do it again sometime. You bet. We're we're, we're definitely gonna have to have a part two. So keep your eyes yeah. and ears out for that. Awesome. Everyone, Dawson Gray. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to another episode of On the Porch with Front Porch Music. We're so lucky to be able to chat with artists and make episodes like this one. If you like the podcast, remember to rate and review us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. It's the easiest way to support the show. Remember to check out frontporchmusic.ca to keep up with new music releases, exclusive artist interviews, and more. We'll catch you again on The Porch in a couple of weeks. On The Porch is hosted by Logan Miller and Jenna Weiser and produced and edited by Jason Saunders. That's me. Our theme song was written, produced, and performed by Owen Wigland.